Welcome back to Open Line. We have with us Michael Vandenberg. He is director of the Climate Change Research Network, a law professor at Vanderbilt. And, um, and we've had several calls. We've had calls on both sides, and they're emotional calls. Um, where all kinds of things have been said about you know this and that and and so you see that with this issue it can be uh, people are passionate on both sides they have passionate feelings on both sides so you have this polarization and 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 so as I mentioned at the top of the show once one party's in power we we do this set of things once another party's in power it swings to the opposite side and why are we so polarized over this issue in your opinion first you're right to seize on this issue a, a recent poll suggested that climate change is the most polarized issue in the United States right now. So uh, there are others that are close to it, as you know, but climate change is number one. And I think we can look to um, what happened with COVID a little bit as an example, because the parallels are quite strong that, again, people, why are we so polarized? People are getting their information through silos, through channels of information. And unlike 40 years ago, you don't have uh, a small set of information sources that are providing information that is uh, attempting to reach some kind of a middle ground. You can choose, if you're a liberal, you can choose liberal media, liberal cable TV, liberal Facebook groups, a liberal Twitter feed. And if you're conservative, you can do the same thing. And then the other thing that's happened over time is that the political parties have sorted into two groups. And the political parties used to have people from different groups in the political parties. So the old Republican Party had Northeastern liberals and Midwestern conservatives and rural and urban people. And the old Democratic Party had Southern conservatives and Northeastern liberals and Western liberals. And now what's happened is they have sorted out. And so the parties now through the party system in the primaries are pushing further and further to the outer edges of the constituencies because you need to win the primary uh, in order to get to the general election. So you combine the silos of information that people are getting with the fact that the parties are getting further and further apart because they have sorted out. And now you combine that with the psychology and that's the third most important piece. We have a deep psychological need to believe that the people in our tribe are good and the people in another tribe are bad. And there's research that even shows you can take a group of people and you can randomly assign them into two different groups and the people can even know that they were randomly assigned. And after a very short period of time, they will start ascribing bad traits to the other group and good to theirs, even though they knew that they were randomly assigned. And so you combine the psychology that pushes us in the direction of seeing our tribe as good and the other tribe as bad with the silos of information through which we get information about climate change and other issues, COVID is the same way, uh, with the parties having an interest in having a deeper uh, difference between the two because they've sorted themselves out. And that's all it takes to get the level of polarization, which is unprecedented in the U.S. Uh, today. And it's certainly true on climate change. What's the major driver, do you think? I, I mean, in, initially, I think there was... A, a lot of pushback from the oil and gas industry and maybe they funded different studies and that kind of thing. It's been interesting to hear you talk about investor pressure now and how many industries are actually coming around and and they are driving this and, and they're not pushing back, they're kind of embracing it. Oil and gas industry may not be 100% there, but are what is the major driver of it? Do you think it is maybe now as much political as anything or is the oil and gas industry, some, some uh, industry like that behind it kind of uh, trying to stop uh, advancement on on climate issues. Uh, there's a little bit of a of a of a combination. I think it's principally now that it has become an identity issue um, on the right. It's become an issue that you can't believe in climate change if you're in one of the parties, um, and uh, and that gets supported and fueled by those interests, fossil fuel interests. But, um, but I think it is, is largely now, much more than it was 20 or 30 years ago, it's largely now an identity issue. And by the way, it's important to remember, you know, if you're one of these folks who thinks there are 30,000 scientists out here who don't believe in climate change, that, you know, as late as about 2007, people like Newt Gingrich, uh, John McCain, the Republican nominee for president, uh, John Warner, the Republican senator from Virginia, we could just go down the list of major Republicans who believed that climate change was happening. And then somewhere around 2008 to 2010, that flipped and it no longer became acceptable to do so. 
Um, and I think that is really, when people look back 100 years from now and try to say what happened to the United States, they'll be trying to understand what was going on during that two or three year period where it went from uh, the presidential candidate of the Republican Party being a co-sponsor of the leading climate bill to being not possible to run for president in the same party if you thought the climate change was a real problem. And I think that shift is a fascinating one, but now it's become you know, part of the DNA of one tribal group or one identity group. And I think the challenge is going to be, you know, do some of the leaders of that party, do they look over the horizon? Do they see where businesses are going? And do they start and where the rest of the world is going? And do they say, you know what, we need to get ourselves to a better place. And I think the biggest place for hope on that, we were talking optimism before, is that it is certainly the case that younger conservatives and Republicans, millennials, et cetera, much more strongly think that climate change is happening and is, should be a priority than older uh, conservatives do. And so when companies are taking these positions, it's often because they want to recruit and retain the best employees. And, uh, and even many conservatives uh, in the younger generations, those numbers drop off by about 10% per decade in terms of support for climate change. But that's another uh, reason for optimism, I think, in the long run. But it's going to take that change of, of, of identity or worldview on the right to get us from here to a place where we can have government do what business is doing right now and respond aggressively to the climate problem. Fascinating. Okay, I mean, we totally have to take a break. So we'll take a break, come back uh, right after this.